begin our story with the emergence of the Bronze Age in the Aegean Sea area. That appears to have taken place about 3000 BC I think these days they date it down about another century to about 2900. Precision is impossible, don't worry about that. And what we find, the first example of a Bronze Age and I use the word civilization now for the first time, because before the Bronze Age there is nothing that we would define as civilization. Civilization involves the establishment of permanent dwelling areas that we call cities, as opposed to villages. Agricultural villages will have existed all over the place in the Late Stone Age, in the Neolithic period, as it is known. But there is a difference and the critical difference is that a city contains a number of people who do not provide for their own support. That is to say, they don't produce food. They need to acquire it from somebody else. Instead, they do various things like governing and are priests, and are bureaucrats, and are engaged in other non-productive activities that depend upon others to feed them. That is the narrowest definition of cities. on society. Of the, uh, social consequences of man's diseases, we should certainly include yellow fever. Now, yellow fever is a deadly disease that's caused by a virus, and it's been the source of many epidemics since at least the 18th century in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. In fact, it still kills more than 30,000 people a year worldwide. And there's still no cure for the disease. However, there is a vaccine to immunize us against it. The road to the discovery of that vaccine was a rocky one, I think. It's called yellow fever because one of its symptoms is jaundice a yellowish color that the skin takes on, because of liver damage. It's transmitted by mosquitoes, either from man to man this is called the urban cycle or from monkey to man this is called the sylvatic or jungle cycle. The disease probably originated in West Africa, and it was carried from there to the West Indies and the New World in the 18th century with the ships of the slave trade. The first big outbreak of yellow fever happened in Cuba in 1762 and 1763, and it killed thousands of American and British colonial troops there. After that, between then and 1900, it killed about 10% of Cuba's population. Raise your hand if you're right-handed. Yep, that looks typical. Most of us, about 90%, are right-handed. T's been that way throughout history. In never dotting nearly every culture, the right has been associated with positive qualities, while the left has been associated with negative, or even evil, ones. In Latin, left means sinister. In ancient Japan, men could reject, or, refuse, to marry women who were left-handed. Um, in modern China, teachers try to force left-handed students to learn to write with their right hands. And, as I'm sure all lefties know, everyday items, like, can openers, uh, scissors, and uh, computer keyboards, are designed for righties. In short, left-handers have been made to feel left out. Get it? It might seem straightforward to you and me, but scientifically speaking, the basis of handedness is not well understood. Most scientists define right-handed or left-handed on the basis of a person's preferred writing hand. But some scientists claim it should be based on the hand that is, um, faster and more accurate in performing manual activities, like tightening a screw or, uh, tying a knot. Still, others claim that ability doesn't matter, in other words, 
that handedness should denote only preference. Hello students, raise your hand. Zero? What a wonderful question. I wish I had a wonderful answer to go with it. Here is the problem, there is actually a law of physics called the third law of thermodynamics, that says you cannot get to the absolute zero, but we don't really know it as true, but we are pretty sure it is for the following reason, every time you think of some way of cooling something down a little bit, it means you try to get energy out of that thing and make the temperature lower. Well if you can get energy out, usually there is a way that the energy can go in as well. And that always means there is a competition between taking the energy out and putting the energy in. Now you can try to make it, so you are favoring getting energy out, but you can't completely stop the energy from going in and that means you might be able to get colder and colder, but you won't be able to get all the way to absolute zero. Could we go back to my PowerPoint? because I think that one of these slides will illustrate that point a little bit better? Yes, here, remember the logarithmic thermometer? There is no zero on this logarithmic thermometer, just keeps going down, you make it a fact of 10 colder, you are not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you re still not a zero. You make it a fact of 10 colder, you are still not a zero. So, you start a million of a degree, now you are 10 million of a degree, now you are 100 million of a degree. Now you are billions of degrees. You never get to zero that way. You get closer and closer, but you never get to zero. So that has why we cannot get to absolute zero. Our first lab, I would like to tell you a little bit about the workbook we will be using. The first thing I would like to point out is that the workbook contains a very large amount of material. Far more than you could ever handle in a single semester. What you are supposed to do is choose the experiments and activities that you want to do within a certain framework of course. Part of my job is to help you make your choices. Next, I would like to mention that in each workbook chapter there are usually two subsections. The first is called experiments and the second is called activities. In the experiments section, the workbook gives full instructions for all the experiments including alternate procedures to the procedure you wish. There is plenty of equipment available. In the activity section, you will find suggestions for projects that you can do on your time. You will see that there are usually no detailed instructions for the activities. You are supposed to do them your own way. If there are no questions let's turn to chapter 1 now.
All my research and that I, I conducted with my 60 plus graduate students was motivated by the need to learn so that we can teach. Of course, in some inventions happened along the way, but I have always considered that the end result, I, I always considered these inventions to be byproducts, byproducts of the learning process. The end product for me was always better understanding, or when one really succeeded, a unifying theory that can help us in teaching the subject. I have also looked at teaching as a vehicle to try new ideas or new ways of doing things on an intelligent group of learners. That is, as a vehicle for teaching research results. In my experience, this kind of teaching is the most stimulating and motivating to students. I have also uncovered many interesting research problems in the course of teaching a subject. It is this unity of research and teaching, their close connection, and the benefits garnered by exercising their interplay that to me characterizes the successful professor. This is a kind of object that you read probably all familiar with when you hear the term robot. But I am going to show you the very first robots. These were the very first robots. There are characters in a play in the 1920s called Rossum S. Universal Robots and their play was written by a Czech writer called Karel Kapik and basically these robots. You know people tend to think of robots as kind of cute cuddly toys or you know Hollywood depictions kind of devoid of politics. But the first robots were actually created and imagined in a time of absolute political turmoil. You just had the First World War. You finished that had a devastating impact across Europe. And people kind of reflecting on what does it mean to be human what makes us human those kinds of questions and this kind on context is what inspired Czech X to kind of write this play and interestingly these robots have been humans. They are actually in the play assembled on a production line a bit like the Ford manufacturing production line. So even though they are human they are assembled and these robots are designed to labor and manage their primary purpose in society. This is Hans Krebs, who in 1937 published a paper so in the sequence of chemical reactions by which energy is released in individual cells. It's called the Krebs cycle which some of you may remember from your chemistry course in high school. Krebs is a wonderful example to me of how a scientist who is determined can overcome all kinds of human obstacles. Krebs father constantly discouraged him and told him that he had just mediocre intelligence and would never do anything important in his life as a teenager. What Krebs remembers in his memoir his father said to him you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And later on when Krebs studied with a great biochemist Otto Warburg. Warburg also told him the same thing not saying quote but that he had the only mediocre ability and would never be a great scientist and we all hear about how important it is for parents to encourage their children. But sometimes the children will go on to do great things no matter what we say to them.
Absolutely. There's a lot of interest in what forms those clouds. Why are those clouds there? Why do they stick around? At the center of every cloud, the drop is a particle. You can't grow a cloud drop without having a particle there for the water to condense on. The key questions that people have not directly addressed until very recently are what actually forms those clouds. And so the ones that you're looking at over the ocean, it turns out sea salt is a very effective nucleate for forming clouds, so there's a really good chance that those are loaded with sea salt. But as you go inland you start to have pollution come from all different kinds of sources, and so different sources form clouds more effectively than others and we're trying to unravel which sources are actually contributing to the clouds. The clouds are incredibly important players in climate change in that they reflect the light back to space, and so they're keeping things much, much cooler than they would be if they weren't there. They also play a huge role in regional weather. So we're actually starting to see shifts where having more pollution input into the clouds is affecting weather patterns, and in particular, it's actually reducing the amount of precipitation, so we're starting to see drought in areas with super high levels of air pollution. Let's proceed to the main exhibit hall and look at some of the actual vehicles that have played a prominent role in speeding up mail delivery. Consider how long it used to take to send a letter across a relatively short distance. Back in the 1600s, it took two weeks on horseback to get a letter from Boston to New York, a distance of about 260 miles. Crossing the river was also a challenge. Ferry service was so irregular that a carrier would sometimes wait hours just to catch a ferry. For journeys inland, there was always the stagecoach, but the ride was by no means comfortable because it had to be shared with other passengers. The post office was pretty ingenious about some routes. In the 19th century, in the southwestern desert, for instance, camels were brought in to help get the mail through. In Alaska, reindeer were used. This practice was discontinued because of the disagreeable temperament of these animals. We'll stop here a minute so that you can enter this replica of a railway mail car. It was during the age of the iron horse that delivery really started to pick up. In fact, the United States transported most bulk mail by train for nearly 100 years. The first airmail service didn't start until 1918. Please take a few moments to look around. I hope you will enjoy your tour. And as you continue on your own, may I suggest you visit our impressive philatelic collection. Not only can you look at some of the more unusual stamps issues, but there is an interesting exhibit on how stamps are made. Most people think of astronomers as people who spend their time in cold observatories peering through telescopes every night. In fact, a typical astronomer spends most of his or her time analyzing data and may only be at the telescope a few weeks of the year. Some astronomers work on purely theoretical problems and never use a telescope at all. You might not know how rarely images are viewed directly through telescopes. The most common way to observe the skies is to photograph them. The process is very simple. First, a photographic plate is coated with a light-sensitive material. The plate is positioned so that the image received by the telescope is recorded on it. Then the image can be developed enlarged and published so that many people can study it because most astronomical objects are very remote. The light we receive from them is rather feeble but by using a telescope as a camera, long-time exposures can be made. In this way. Objects can be photographed that is a hundred times too faint to be seen by just looking through a telescope. Before we start our first lab, 
I would like to tell you a little bit about the workbook we will be using. The first thing I would like to point out is that the workbook contains a very large amount of material. Far more than you could ever handle in a single semester. What you are supposed to do is choose the experiments and activities that you want to do within a certain framework of course. Part of my job is to help you make your choices. Next, I would like to mention that in each workbook chapter there are usually two subsections. The first is called experiments and the second is called activities. In the experiments section, the workbook gives full instructions for all the experiments including alternate procedures to the procedure you wish. There is plenty of equipment available. In the activity section, you will find suggestions for projects that you can do on your time. You will see that there are usually no detailed instructions for the activities. You are supposed to do them your own way. If there are no questions let's turn to chapter 1 now. The Old Canada Road is a long lost trail between the Canadian province of Quebec and Maine in the northeast corner of the United States. Yes, it really was lost and finding it again was a complex process that involved state-of-the-art technology. How the location of the road was pinpointed was very interesting and I'll return to it as soon as I have given you a little background information. The road began in 1817 a few years before Maine even became a state at the time Quebec was a major market for livestock crops and fish. So a road to Quebec was seen by officials in Maine as necessary for trade. For about 20 years the movement of people and goods was mostly from Maine to Quebec but then the trend reversed as thousands of Canadians emigrated to Maine to escape poor crops, a lack of jobs and the threat of disease. I think it was a cholera epidemic. Besides these negative reasons major building projects in Maine also made the state very attractive for the Canadians who needed work. I should stress though that immigration during that period went in both directions. In fact, the flow of people and goods went completely unhindered. There wasn't even a border post until around 1850. The people of the time saw Maine and Quebec as a single region mainly because of the strong French influence which is still evident in Maine today eventually the road fell into disuse as a major railway was completed. Finally, people simply forgot about it and that's how it came to be lost. This brings me back to the original topic. Do you have trouble sleeping at the night then maybe this is for you? When you worry about find a comfortable position. You are probably only making matters worse. What happens when you do that is that your heart rate actually increases making it more difficult to relax. You may also have some bad habits that contribute to the problem. Do you rest frequently during the day? Do you get virtually no exercise or do you exercise strenuously late in the day? Are you preoccupied with sleep or do you sleep late on weekends? Any or all of these factors might be leading to your insomnia by disrupting your body's natural rhythm. What should you do then on those sleepless nights? Don't bother with sleeping pills, they can actually cause worse insomnia later. The best thing to do is drink milk or eat cheese or tuna fish. These are all rich in amino acids and help produce a neurotransmitter in the brain that induces sleep. This neurotransmitter will help you relax and you'll be on your way to getting a good night's sleep until tomorrow's broadcast. This has been another in the series of Hints for Good Health. Scientists preparing for NASA's proposed Jupiter icy moons orbiter believe that Jupiter's moons Europa may be a corrosive mixture of acid and peroxide. Thus, it may not be the ideal place for life to exist as was thought possibly to be the case. Virtually all the information we have about Europa comes from the spacecraft Galileo, 
which completed its mission to study Jupiter and its moons close up before NASA dramatically crashed it into Jupiter in 2003. Although the general perception of Europa is of a frozen crust of water ice harboring a salty subterranean ocean kilometers below, researchers studying the most recent measurements say light reflected from the moon's icy surface bears the spectral fingerprints of hydrogen peroxide and strong acids. However they accept that it could just be a thin surface dusting and might not come from the ocean below. Sports are not limited to the sp It is found that children who participate in challenging sports contests also love the classroom challenges and can function in a competitive society. Regular participation in sports teaches children to play the game of school and life. They know well how to win the losing game, means going out of hand. Sports persons become very disciplined and confident in their whole life and never become hopeless from hard life struggles. They easily develop morals, necessary skills and art of living. In such a technological world, the competition is increasing regularly in the society which needs more effort from the children and youths to go ahead. In such case, sports and games play creative roles in developing a peaceful mind and highly skilled mind which is very necessary to survive in a competitive field. Anybody who is interested in sports activities never gives up or quit from any game of life. Participating in sports and games teaches to be a team player to them who have an attitude to always be the center of attention. Sports and games or confidence building activities also give lots of fun to the children. It brings the sense of improvement, accomplishment and feeling of personal progress. Nowadays, girls are also participating in the sports and games activities to the same extent as boys on their own will without hesitation from the family or society. Sports are career builder activities build a better and bright career. Children of the modern time are getting very interested in the variety of sports and games as they get motivated by sports TV shows or cartoon networks at an early age. natural resources are everything created by the nature on this earth and given to us as the God gift for the easy survival of life here. The progress of whole human fraternity worldwide depends on the different natural resources and various means. However, human beings are using natural resources in wrong ways which surely lead us to suffer from the total lack of all natural resources in the future. We are only using the resources for fulfilling our various needs without regenerating them back natural resources like water, trees, woods, soil, coal, electricity, oil, gas, nuclear energy, minerals, vegetation, wildlife, etc. are very necessary for the proper development of any nation. Natural resources are a form of energy or matter fulfills the needs of people in various aspects like physiological, cultural, socioeconomic, etc. All the natural resources benefit us in various means of life as well as play great roles in maintaining the ecological balance all over the planet. Natural resources are of two types named as renewable resources and non-renewable resources. The resources which can get back by the natural cycles are called as renewable resources. However, resources which cannot get back again by the natural processes are called as the non-renewable resources. Renewable resources can be reproduced as they get utilized such as fish, water, forests, woods, crops, leather, soil, solar energy, wood products, etc. Non-renewable resources are limited and cannot be reproduced such as metals, like iron, zinc, copper, etc. Fossil fuels, like coal, oil deposits, etc. Minerals, salts, like phosphates, carbonates, nitrates, etc stone and many more. Once we lose the non-renewable resources in our life, we cannot get it back as it is gone forever. All such types of natural resources are very necessary to make our life possible on earth. So, we should try our best to preserve and conserve both natural resources.
Good morning to my respected teachers and my dear friends, I would like to speech on the topic of global warming today. Global warming is mainly caused by the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Some of the greenhouse gases are CO2, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide and ozone. When these gases get collected to the lower environment, it makes a cover which easily allows all the hot radiations of sun to the earth however restrict its escape back to the space. This process is called as the greenhouse effect. Such gases in the atmosphere trap hot radiations and keep earth warm by increasing temperature. The level of greenhouse gases also raise because of the human activities such as burning trees, burning fissile fuels, electric lights, use of refrigerator, microwave, air conditioner, and other electric machines. Such process releases high percentage of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere causing the earth temperature to rise. Rise in heat causes more water from earth to evaporate into atmosphere. Water vapor again absorbs more heat and makes Earth atmosphere warmer. Global warming has changed natural processes rainfall patterns, length of seasons, rise of sea level, ecology balance and many more. It is a powerful demon affecting our lives to a great extent so it needs to be solved on urgent basis by the effort of all of us. Welsh is a Celtic language spoken in Wales by about 740,000 people and in the Welsh colony in Patagonia, Argentina by several hundred people. There are also Welsh speakers in England, Scotland, Canada, the USA, Australia and New Zealand. At the beginning of the 20th century about half of the population of Wales spoke Welsh as an everyday language. Towards the end of the century, the proportion of Welsh speakers had fallen to about 20%. According to the 2001 census 582,368 people can speak Welsh, 659,301 people can either speak, read or write Welsh, and 797,717 people, 28% of the population, claim to have some knowledge of the language. According to a survey carried out by S4C, the Welsh Languages TV channel, the number of Welsh speakers in Wales is around 750,000, and about 1.5 million people can understand Welsh. In addition, there are an estimated 133,000 Welsh speakers living in England, about 50,000 of them in the Greater London area. Only one country, tiny little Bhutan, uh, wedged between China and India, has adopted the gross national happiness as the uh, central uh, index of uh, government policy, and actually has had a good deal of success in education and in health and in economic growth and in environmental preservation, uh, and they have a rather sophisticated way of measuring the effects of different policies on, the, on people's happiness. But they are the only country to go that far. 
But you're now beginning to get other countries interested enough to do kind of white paper policy analyses about whether uh, happiness research, uh, what effects would it have if we used it more for public policy. Uh,